Texas. She always had this love for music. In fact, that's what people remember most about Brandy. She wanted to be a country singer when she got older, and she was always involved in music in some way or another. Brandy attended Chapel Hill High School, and she did really good in school. She was also very involved in Color Guard, and she even got a scholarship to the University of Texas. So, she goes to her first year of college and loves it. She kind of just eats the whole experience up. She loved being in Color Guard. And for those of you who are not familiar with what that is, they are the people who dance with the marching band. And a lot of times they hold flags and they kind of dance with the flags. So she's really, really into that and just loves her first year of college. Her second year of college, she ends up getting married and she's very young and still trying to balance college and color guard in this new marriage. And eventually it all just became too much for Brandy, so she decides she needs to drop out of school. The marriage, however, doesn't last, and Brandy gets divorced pretty soon after she was married. And, you know, she had really been through a lot of heavy things. She had dropped out of college, married, and divorced. And she was still fairly young, so she moves to San Antonio for a little while, and then she ends up in Brownsboro, Texas, where she decides she's going to make a fresh start. She needs a redo. So she gets a place there with a roommate and starts taking the steps to get her life back on track. She turns in an application at Walmart and she's hired there. Now she doesn't start working yet. The manager is still trying to fit her into the schedule. Brandy also applies at the Trinity Valley Community College. And because of all her involvement with a color guard, she gets accepted and a scholarship. So she's just really excited. In fact, she calls her best friend to tell her the news. She's getting all of her ducks in a row and things are just working out perfectly for her. She wants to study education in college so she can become a kindergarten teacher. On August 2nd, 2006, Brandy shows up at her mother's apartment in Tyler, Texas. And this was not a planned visit, so Brandy's mother was surprised to see her, but very happy. Brandy was getting ready to start class. 
she's an adult and she probably drank too much and ended up going to crash at a friend's house so she didn't drive home. So she thinks nothing of this. Later that day, Brandy's roommate calls her mother, Ellen, and asks if Brandy's there. Brandy was supposed to be back at their apartment and she wasn't and she couldn't get a hold of her. Brandy's mom begins trying to get a hold of Brandy and it's going straight to voicemail and she's not particularly concerned but it is weird and as time goes on she gets more and more concerned because her calls just keep going straight to voicemail. The next day, on August 4th, Ellen is just freaking out. She can't find her daughter anywhere. She can't get a hold of her. Nobody's seen her in two days. So she files a missing persons report with the Tyler Police Department. And as she's telling them Brandy's plans for the night before, Brandy's little sister kind of speaks up and says she wasn't actually going to a bar in Tyler. She planned on going to Graham Central Station, clear out in Longview. And her mother had thought she had been in town this whole time. So she files the police report and then she drives out to Graham Central Station in Longview to see if she can see anything. So several members of Brandy's family and friends drive out to Graham Central Station. They're looking in the parking lot they begin searching the ravine around this club to see if there's any signs of brandy, but they find absolutely nothing. On August 5th, Brandy's mom calls the Tyler Police Department because she hasn't heard anything from them and she's terrified. And they tell her that Longview Police Department has taken over the case. And so she needs to now go and file a missing persons report in Longview. On August 6th, police get this tip from a motorist who says, Look, I travel down I-20 every day to go to work and home. And there's this car that's just been abandoned on the side of the road for days. I feel like somebody should look into it. And the license plate was given and police realize this car belongs to their missing person. So they go out to the scene, they search the car, and there's nothing immediately that sticks out to them as suspicious. There's no signs that a crime has been committed in the car or in the vicinity of the car. They take out um, canines and cadaver dogs to kind of search the area, but these dogs are not able to pick up any kind of scent of brandies. So one of the detectives on this case kind of explained why they may have not been able to pick up a scent. Either Brandy wasn't in her car when it was left on the side of the road, so she couldn't have got out and left a scent. But also these dogs were not brought in till about four days after she had gone missing, so it's possible it had just been too long and her scent was kind of lost. It had rained, there were tons of cars driving down the highway flipping up water, and it's very possible that they were just alerted to the car too late. Police did find Brandy's purse in the car and a cell phone that they believed was hers. And they also 
she changed her mind. This man was very forthcoming with the police and they ruled him out as having anything to do with her disappearance. At this point, police don't have much to go on and time is ticking by very quickly with not really any leads. So they bring in the FBI and a further examination of Brandy's car is done and there are a few weird things. So the way that Brandy's car had been pulled off the highway, she was kind of at an angle to the road. The keys were missing and the driver's side door was left ajar. So, she either ran out of gas and coasted off the road and wasn't able to kind of straighten out, or whoever was driving that car got off very quickly and was trying to exit the vehicle as fast as possible. Now, Brandy is five feet. She's a short girl. And police notice that her seat is pushed back as far as it will go, which means it is not likely she was driving her car when it was left abandoned on the side of the road. In the trunk of her car, there is also a gas can, and her family and friends, even her roommate, Nobody thinks this gas can belongs to Brandy. Police then look into the surveillance at Grand Central Station. Now this club, you had to swipe your driver's license to get in. And Brandy's driver's license had been swiped at 10.44 p.m. So they're looking through the security footage and there's two cameras located at this club. There's one at the entrance and there's one above the bar. So police ask um, Brandy's family to come see if they can pick her out of this footage. So her sister, her godmother and her sister-in-law all come in to look at this footage. And at 10.45, so the same time as her license was swiped, they see a girl who looks like Brandy enter into the club and she's with two men. And they see her at the club with these two men and then there's footage of her just outside the club talking to one of these men. They have no idea who these men are. So police release this footage and they ask anyone with information about who these two men might be to get a hold of them because they are possible persons of interest in this case. While the police officers are at this club investigating, they take statements from several of the people who were working that night, but they don't have much to go on. They do know that she called the club several times before she arrived trying to get directions so it would seem like she didn't go directly there. She was a little bit lost. Police also know she only had one drink at the club. Ten days go by and there's just no more information. Police are not able to turn up any leads. No one is reaching out about the footage of these men at the club. And so the Longview Police Department asked her mother to come down and give them a DNA sample. 
so they have that to compare if they need it. And while they're down there, they ask her to look at her daughter's phone because they're coming up with some really weird things on this phone. They have tried to call several of the contacts in the phone and most of these people don't even know who Brandy is. So it's really weird that she would have all these numbers and they don't even know her. Brandy's mother takes one look at the phone and realizes that is not her daughter's phone. As it would turn out, this phone belonged to an ex-boyfriend of Brandy's who had been deployed to Iraq and wasn't even in the country. Now the investigators realize she may still have her phone with her. They get a subpoena so that they can get all of her cell records and pings. But our family is not waiting for that subpoena. They go to Brandy's really good friend. The two girls shared a cell phone plan, so they were instantly able to get access to any activity on her phone. Now, in the days leading up to her disappearance, everything is normal. But about ten days after Brandy goes missing, her cell phone starts being used again, and it's just call after call after call after call, but these calls are only like 30 seconds to a minute. And so now police have kind of a big break. Her cell phone is being used. They look at all of these calls and they are able to track down two individuals who had been receiving calls from Brandy's number. And these two people tell police the same name, the same person that has been calling them. So now police have the name of the first potential person of interest. So they track this guy down and he has Brandy's cell phone. This man tells police that he found Brandy's cell phone. It was just like laying on the ground in this neighborhood. Now this neighborhood is on the south side of town and it's a bad area. It's known for drug and sex trafficking. It's a very sketchy place, and police have no idea if A, the phone was found there, and B, if it was, was Brandy ever there? They were never able to place her there. Now this guy gives them like three different stories about where he found the phone and how he found the phone. And they're all pretty similar, but they're not the exact same story. So police ask him, hey, look, we can have the FBI do a lie detector test right now and you can yourself out as a suspect, but he declined to take the polygraph, although later he did, and he failed it, and police are not ruling this person out as a suspect, but his name was never released. While police are working behind the scenes to try and solve this case, Brandy's family is doing everything in their power to keep public interest on Brandy's disappearance. They're calling the news stations and newspapers all the time. They have signs made up everywhere. They are just doing all that a family can do. They're conducting searches. So many searches were done for Brandy. 
location to where her car was found. That whole area was covered, but nothing was ever really found. Now, six weeks after Brandy disappears, her case is kind of cold. There's no new leads, tips, or information, and police have nothing to go on. Brandy's mom, in hopes of kind of reviving the investigation, asks if she can look over the footage from the club. She had not been one of the original people to verify that Brandy was with those men. So police let her look at this footage and right away she says, that is not my daughter. She did not leave the house wearing that outfit. And I know because she had come out and showed me her outfit. Now this woman did have the same hair and body type as Brandy. But as she's watching the footage, she sees Brandy come in the club about 10 minutes after this woman, and Brandy enters alone. Now, come to find out, she had swiped her driver's license, and the machine that recorded the swipes was about 10 minutes off from the security camera. So when police are telling our family she swiped at 10.45, and they see this woman who resembles her on the footage, they're all thinking, okay, this is her. But it wasn't. Brandy walks in 10 minutes later in the outfit her mother saw her leaving the house in. She comes in alone, and she leaves alone. The only clue police have is the last maybe three seconds of this footage that's above the club door. So Brandy walks out and she's walking out of frame and then all you see is her feet and she turns the other way so they know she was walking out this way and at the very last second completely changed her direction. Maybe somebody called her name. Maybe somebody recognized her. We don't know. That is all police know of this footage. A few months later, on October 29th, this burned body gets found and it's in an oil field of Clegg County, which is about seven miles from where Brandy's car was found. This body was completely unrecognizable. The only thing police knew was that she was wearing a purple sweater and jeans, and people thought this was Brandy. An autopsy was done, and they said it was the remains of a white female. Brandy's family is thinking they found her, but they submit dental records, and it is not Brandy's remains. This woman was dubbed the Lavender Doe, and she was not identified till last year in 2019, and her name was Dana Dodd. Now, over the years, there have been countless searches for Brandy. In fact, one time, one of her best friends was out searching the area behind the club, and they found this bag of bones they thought belonged to Brandy, but they ended up just being animals. 